Good afternoon. This is Dr. Dan Guerra from Verev Med Studios in the Pacific Northwest, and welcome to a brand new 2018 video lecture. Today, we're going to talk about ceramide biochemistry and human disease. I'm going to give you an overview based on our previous knowledge base that we generated right before the Christmas holiday. Before Christmas, I gave a lecture on ceramide biochemistry in the general sense, how ceramide is synthesized, how it's a central metabolite and sphingolipid metabolism. So with that armamentarium, with that knowledge base, we'll be able to now go directly into the literature and examine how ceramide, this very interesting lipid molecule, which has some similarities to diacylglycerol, for those of you who want to be in the know, um, really does mediate a lot of physiology and pathophysiology as we understand it in human disease and in health. So let's get started. All right, so just a really quick reminder, I'm Vera Med, and we are coming to you from the Pacific Northwest, that's me, and this is my direct email, this is the company email and the company uh, mm -hmm. web address. Uh, this is also my Facebook page. Uh, all of these uh, sources are excellent ways to communicate with me. Uh, and so please feel free to do that when you want to um, uh, become a client of ours. Or if you just want a general question about what Vera Med does, I'd be glad to answer your questions electronically. Uh, what we basically do is we examine the primary scientific literature and use that literature to answer questions for our clients. Our clients range anywhere from lawyers and physicians to nurses to also lay people who have uh, interest in knowing more about their health and potential disease and maybe drug interactions that they're taking for a given ailment. We also talk about nutraceuticals and uh, I also cover the gamut of looking at over-the-counter uh, herbal medicines and how they do or don't affect human metabolism. So pretty broad range. I'm a trained lipid biochemist, PhD biochemist. I've been a professor for over 30 years and this is a launching of my company and that's what we do. So let's get started with just this uh, lecture today. So fatty acid synthesis causes drug resistance by inhibiting tumor necrosis factor and ceramide production, the name of a paper uh, that came out now some uh, five years ago. So we're going to look at this paper real briefly, and then we're going to move through others. Now, the expression of the fatty acid synthase is typically low in normal non-adipose tissues. However, cancer cells <clears throat> synthesize more than 90% of their triacylglycerol, it's the neutral storage lipid, uh, directly. Now, why that's significant is because it's an excellent fuel for cell division, and we all know that cancer cells rapidly divide autonomously, and that's what leads to tumor genesis. So fatty acids is good fuel. The source of those fatty acids is stored triacylglycerol. So the question is the significance of fatty acid synthase or FAS in cancer cell proliferation and survival, and what its real potential is in oncogenic function um, has certainly been amply demonstrated. There have been a lot of theories uh, thrown out, such as maybe those fatty acids are used for, for example, angiogenesis, because fatty acids, of course, can be used for membrane synthesis. Maybe also growth factors are turned on. There's a lot of <clears throat> well-known association of lipids and growth stimulation. So those are all questions that still need to be really hammered down and answered better. So let's go into it. <clears throat> the overexpression expression of the enzyme complex itself, the FAS complex, has been associated, unfortunately, with poor prognosis and higher risk and recurrence of some of the major cancers that afflict humans and kill us. Breast cancer, prostate cancer, those are two examples. Uh, increased fatty acid synthesis expression, that is the expression of the protein, may contribute both to disease progression and to treatment failure. So those are two different avenues to, to explore. One is the disease progression itself, which is more of a biological, maybe we'd call it a pathophysiological response. And the other is why do treatments, normal, for example, chemotherapeutics, fail when we have a high expressing tumor uh, for fatty acid synthesis? There's two different things in a way. 
Over on the right here, just a very brief um, truncated summary of what fatty acid synthesis looks like. Remember that it starts off with acetyl-CoA, central metabolite in the cell. You have to make malonyl-CoA in order for decommitting that carbon to synthesis of fatty acids, and also, of course, the cholesterol and the isoprenes. Um, anyways, that's the rate limiting enzyme, acetyl-CoA-carboxylase. Again, I went over this all in previous lectures in December. Um, but basically, you just run this carbon into the cycle. You're increasing the synthesis of fatty acids at two carbon lengths at a time. Ultimately, you end up with a palmitic acid associated with this acyl carrier protein, which is, is a thioester linkage embedded within the FAS complex. Uh, and then that fatty acid is hydrolyzed by an FAS associated uh, enzyme activity known as the thioesterase that removes that palmitic acid, which is then reesterified to coenzyme A and then put in the metabolic play. So that's all I'm going to say about de novo FAS, I think. Okay, so FAS overexpression, as I've said, is found in a drug-selected breast cancer cell line, and the elevation of this contributed to cellular resistance. Here we go. Here's the drug resistance uh, factors. Uh, adriamycin, um, mitoxantrone, and, in, and also gemcitabine in, pan in pancreatic ductal carcinoma. So there's three different examples where overexpression of FAS in this in various cancers um, block the effect of uh, typical common chemotherapeutics. So how does that work, right? What's going on there? So the study we're talking about here investigated that molecular mechanism, and then we're doing it in a cell line. A lot of these a lot of these experiments are done in cell lines before they end up in the clinical trials. So what they found was that uh, the overexpression of the fatty acid synthase protein complex, the enzyme complex, causes resistance to those multiple uh, anti-cancer drugs we just looked at, but also resistance to gamma radiation, which is not you know, directly drug-related. So that means that um, the FAS overexpression is blocking something that normally would control cell proliferation at the fundamental level of cell biology. And probably something to do with apoptosis, as it says there. Now, what these papers have looked at is that it seems as though uh, one of the mechanisms is involved in triggering programmed cell death. And triggering programmed cell death, that's where we can now uh, entreat a discussion of the very important sphingolipid known as ceramide. Ceramide production is one of the uh, initial factors that turn on the caspase activity, which ultimately leads to cellular apoptosis. Now, remember, if you get cancer cells that go through apoptosis, that's good because that means those cells are dead and that then inhibits further cell proliferation, tumorigenesis, and perhaps metastasis as well of that, can of that primary cancer. So you get the point. So uh, FAS overexpression suppresses specifically uh, factors that you'd want to have tuned up in cancer cells. TNF-alpha, uh, NF-kappa-B, which transcription factor, and the drug-induced activation of neutral sphingomyelinase. Now, the neutral sphingomyelinase, of course, you recall from uh, that uh, lecture I gave in um, late December, uh, is one of the ways you make ceramide. Okay, so sphingomyelin is broken down to uh, ceramide. Okay, that's what happens. Okay, so FAS overexpression may cause drug resistance by inhibiting that expression of the TNF-alpha, which is, again, a pro-inflammatory cytokine associated with killing cells. And then that may, in turn, suppress the activation of the transcription factor out of kappa B, and maybe that then controls the neutral sphingomyelinase expression and activity, and that reduces then the ceramide production, and that reduces the caspase A activation, and ultimately apoptosis tanks. So that's the linear progression. So the mechanism may involve maintenance, actually, of the mitochondrial function. So this paper that I just told you was now five years old. So if you jump ahead to right now, so a paper that was published, as you see, just a few weeks ago in uh, mid to late December of 2017. This is the 6th of January. I'm giving this lecture of 2018, actually the Feast of the Epiphany. <clears throat> Anyways, this paper... Uh, published very recently in Biomedicine and Pharmacotherapy, suggests that the mechanism may involve maintenance of the mitochondrial function. Now, how does that work? 
Uh, that's because targeting fatty acid for beta oxidation, okay? So when you have an active fatty acid synthase and you make fatty acids and you have an active release of those fatty acids in the cytoplasm, they can go directly in through the current carnitine pomidogrel transferase pathway into the mitochondria of those tumor cells and thus be used to make ATP. Now, when that happens, you have a rapid cycling through the NADH, NAD plus ratio um, decline. And because of that, you don't build up reactive oxygen species. You don't get partially reduced forms of oxygen because you're running the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation at full throttle, right? Because you're generating all this fatty acid and it's getting burned in beta oxidation. Beta oxidation, remember, makes NADH and FADH2, which ultimately get reoxidized and electrons and protons move through through chemiosmosis to generate ATP via that complex 5 ATP synthase, right? Sure. So that paper then suggested further that they found they think a native protein that inhibits in fact the thioesterase domain of the fatty acid synthase because it binds to it. <laughs> and binding, of course, to that thioesterase domain, what do you think is going to go down there? Wow, it's going to block the release of that palmitate. You block the release of the palmitate, you intoxicate, you, you poison the fatty acid synthase. Right? So that's one way the cells probably overcome the production of carbon sources for energy in tumor cells by blocking the thioesterase domain of the fatty acid synthase. And that's something that's really cool, really interesting. Again, brand new, just published a few weeks back. And again, if you then shut down the thioesterase, okay, you shut down the utilization, the production of the, uh, for example, palmitic acid, you shut down the production of the palmitic acid for fuel. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm saying that because later on it's going to matter. And what goes down then? Well, you get some NADH and you get some FADH2, but there isn't sufficient drive for the electron transport chain. So you start generating not fully reduced oxygen. Um, i.e. water, but you make those partially reduced forms of oxygen, so it's just superoxide, hydrogen peroxide, hydroxyl anion, hydroxyl radical, and those are toxic, and those generate the cascade, which ultimately leads to apoptosis and killing those cells and their tumor cells, bravo. Okay, so that's the mechanism brought to full, full scale, and it took several years for me to find a good paper that really uh, finished off that mechanism. There are a lot of papers published since the one I just told you, None of them really got that much closer. There were a lot of theories, but that one I really like because it's direct and succinct. Okay, so this is just a cartoon uh, showing you what happens normally that you get a death ligand binding to a death receptor. This could be like the PDL, PDLR. Uh, it turns on caspase. Uh, caspase ultimately causes, you know, apoptosis, but also you generate the activity of sphingomyelinase, making ceramide that supervenes and super activates the caspase 3 pathway. And then basically um, both using the mitochondrial mediated apoptosis and the direct uh, cytoplasmic apoptosis, you kill that cell. Now I'm showing you this because there's another protein we should keep in mind. I think we're going to see this later on in clinical trials and also, of course, in the literature prior to that. And that is this inhibitor of apoptosis, or the IAP protein. Now, that protein overexpressed in cancer is known to contribute to cancer cell survival. It also is involved in chemo resistance. And it's also involved in immunosuppression, all bad things if you want to kill the cancer cell. So it looked, and this is from a paper from 2013, this information here about IAP, this is a much older paper here. So what I'm trying to say is that's something else to target and think about. Is fatty acid synthesis, are the products of fatty acid synthesis, are uh, the expression of the protein itself in the cytoplasm, do any of those have any role in making IAP? That's another thing to remember. The one thing you have to uh, always keep in mind about biochemical pathways and um, uh, clinical biochemistry and medicine is that when you can go and you can isolate and you can put on your really fancy spectacles and say, there, that's what's causing it, right? That's the thing that's happening. Now, that's where the bad guy is, right? Like in Last Action Hero. Well, guess what? There's always more than one bad guy, and there's usually more than one good way to ameliorate it, right? Multi-complex systems, network systems is how cells work, not any one given thing. Okay. Now, second paper I want to look at real quickly is skeletal. So that's that one there, right? It was about cancer. Now, check this guy out. 
Skeletal muscle triacylglycerol. Sorry, it says triglycerides in the title. I can't change the title. People made the mistake when they put it in there. It should say triacylglycerol, just like it says diacylglycerol. Silly people don't get the idea there's no such thing as a triglyceride. Uh, skeletal muscle triacylglycerol, DAG, and ceramide and insulin resistance is another paradox when you look at endurance trained athletes. Now, for years I was teaching in a uh, exercise physiology nutrition uh, department, and we were looking a lot at what induces insulin resistance in muscle cells because we were interested in obesity associated uh, diseases such as uh, metabolic diseases such as uh, diabetes type 2. So let's take a look at this paper real quick. Then. Again, an older paper, but it's okay. Chronic exercise and obesity both increase something called intramyocellular TAG or IMTGs despite having opposing effects on insulin sensitivity. So chronic exercise that is working out all the time, you actually make more of this IMTG and that becomes a fuel for sustaining muscle contraction, muscle activity, right? So for long distance runners, for example, long distance runners have a lot of intramyocellular tag and it's not a bad thing. Now, why is it also found in obese patients? Well, for one thing, the lipid that you find in obese muscle cells is different in terms of how it pools. It's not actually one central oil droplet like it is in um, high uh, functioning athletes. It's actually more dispersed. And because of that, the lipid isn't metabolized the same way. In fact, it's metabolized less efficiently. Okay. So that, just because you get intramyocellular tag doesn't mean it's good or bad. It has to do with all the downstream processing. That's the take home message. So these folks in this paper way back in 2011, wow, you know, everybody was much younger then, uh, they had two hypotheses here. One is a chronically exercised trained muscle could be characterized by lower skeletal muscle diacylglycerol. Remember, if you peel off one of the fatty acids on tag and run that fatty acid into uh, mitochondria, you know, being the carnitine palmitoyl transferase pathway, ultimately making ATP from the oxidation, beta oxidation pathway. You're going to make some DAG, right? So maybe lower skeletal muscle DAG and ceramide. Now, ceramide is associated with DAG production because it's associated with phosphatidylcholine metabolism. Um, despite having IM, high IMTGs in those uh, athletes, might account for the higher insulin sensitivity. Okay, because if you have a lot of DAG and a lot of ceramide, that can decrease insulin sensitivity because DAG turns on, for example, protein kinase C, and that has an effect of stimulating uh, carbohydrate metabolism in such a way that it can actually inhibit insulin sensitivity because it decreases the amount of GLUT4 that makes it to the membrane. I know that's a mouthful, but I know many of you have watched all my other um, lectures. I almost said stimulating, but I I want to be humble and say, I don't know if they were. Uh, at any rate, um, it all comes together. So the second hypothesis, now that's all interesting. Second hypothesis these folks suggested was the expression of key skeletal muscle proteins, such as proteins associated with the lipid droplets <clears throat> uh, and those involved in uh, triacylglycerol metabolism and fatty acid partitioning, such as the carnitine pathways, could all be associated with what's called a lipotoxic phenotype. That lipotoxic phenotype, which may be really, really cool in a cancer cell, is really not cool in an obese muscle cell. So always remember that these disease states, there's a, there's, a, there's a basal foundation where they're associated, but they go totally different pathways. So cancer is a totally different problem than insulin-resistant uh, muscle cells, right? right? Yet we can learn something from understanding both. So they, in this study, I'll, I'm going to go to a little bit more of the molecularity of it. Uh, there were 14 normal weight endurance trained athletes that were called NWAs. There were several normal weight sedentary folks, NWSs, and there were 21 obese and sedentary OBS. Those are the people that, well, they weren't doing so good, if you know what I mean. Uh, and they looked at insulin sensitivity. Uh, they did so by using glucose clamps, like glucose uptake experiments. They looked at the amount of intramyocellular um, triglycerides, DAG ceramides, and they looked at different kinds of protein expression. All of this from muscle punch biopsies. So again, some background on this real quickly. Skeletal muscle insulin resistance is associated with obesity, of course. So again, obese people have insulin resistance. That's type 2 diabetes. Um, 
and that might be associated with physical activity. And we need to understand how that's all linked to the development of frank type 2 diabetes, right? TGD. Now, the causes of insulin resistance within the muscle are not really well known. Even now, we're not sure. We have a lot of good theories. We have a lot of good experiments that support and bolster those theories. But again, remember what I told you about the complex networking of, of cells, particularly pathophysiological states in cells. So anyway, there are concerted efforts that have been made over the past several years to understand how this IM, uh, adrenomyocellular lipid, okay, so not just saying triacylglycerol, saying total lipid or IMCL, um, may be involved in developing IR. And remember, why is there more lipid in the uh, 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 muscle cell? Well, because that's what happens when you're obese. You get more lipid distributed throughout the body, not just in the viscera. It's all over. It's all throughout the body, including your muscles, okay? In fact, you know this from cardiovascular disease and the amount of lipid is associated in the heart. Lab. Sure you do. Okay, now studies in both animal models and humans provided a very early evidence. So these are actual you know, studies that these IMCLs, such as triacylglycerol, were associated with skeletal muscle insulin resistance. However, the athlete's paradox, the fact that you still have this intramyocellular lipid, and they are certainly not insulin resistant, these athletes, um, is, is, is a paradox, right? It's like, how come you've got both things? I already told you it could have something to do with subcellular biology, okay? So they gave pause to a wide variety, uh, wide, widely held view, wide held variety of views that IMCL causes uh, insulin resistance within the muscle. And that lets support that maybe something else is involved, right? So you got these, okay, cool. But maybe that's not the thing we need to be looking at. All right. So DAG and ceramide are argued as lipotoxic metabolites for various reasons. Evidence from cell systems and animal models, including human, indicate that elevated diacylglycerol and ceramides, which remember ceramides are involved in programmed cell death, are associated with impaired insulin signaling and therefore um, insulin resistance. Previous studies examined skeletal muscle DAG and ceramide content, um, but they were limited and inconsistent. Many of the studies just don't give you really good results one way or the other. They show chronic exercise training increasing intramyocellular triacylglycerols. Therefore, studies have been conducted to examine both uh, diacylglycerol and ceramides and whether or not those may be reduced with exercise. Okay, that'd be the argument, right? Prevalent notion is that the higher mitochondrial content of these really uh, high-functioning athletic muscle cells and the capacity for good fatty acid beta oxidation, because you're exercise training, may actually decrease the total amount of DAG. Why? Because you don't just peel off one fatty acid from TAG and that's it. You have a lot of DAG. DAG, remember, is a signaling molecule. And it can be. And it's also a metabolite. So DAG becomes MAG, monoacylglycerol, becomes glycerol, okay? And each one of those is conducted by, okay, each one of those uh, removals of those fatty acids is conducted by a lipase, which is active in active muscle tissue, right? Those are muscle lipases, muscle neutral lipid uh, lipases. All right, so um, I don't think I want to go through this whole thing with you. I just want you to keep in mind, I love that line, that fatty acid metabolism is very complex, as I know you're all very uh, attuned to because you've been listening to my lectures, and it involves a lot of subcellular organelles, such as the, the endoplasmic reticulum, the mitochondria, and even the peroxisome. It's just showing you synthesis of the various lipids, such as there's triacylglycerol, all the enzymatic reactions involved, all the intermediates, and how there's an interplay between tag synthesis, of course, because all the intermediates are shared, and phospholipid synthesis, and even not shown here, thank God, because it would increase the complexity of the slides substantially, uh, shrinkle lipid metabolism, and even cholesterol metabolism. So it's just so much involved there, and it's just showing you glycerol lipid metabolism, right? Just showing you that all these intracellular compartments to have a lot of enzymatic reactions. Any one of these could go south, could go bad in obesity versus, for example, example tumor cells. All right. So one thing that is known when you get hyperglycemia, such as in diabetes, diacylglycerol is increased. Diacylglycerol turns on a particular isoform of protein kinase C called beta-2. And look at all the things that enzyme does, right? 
uh, basically, uh, it leads to diabetic vascular complications, okay? It causes angiogenesis cell turnover. It, close, it causes flow contractility. It can cause product, uh, fibrinolysis and adhesion of cells. Look at all these different players here that are involved. Badgev, more PKC activity, CFOS. And you'll notice here a lot of these genes, I know you physicians will and you scientists will, are the same players that you see right below the surface when you're looking at various tumors, right? TGF-beta, CFOS, TGF, uh, VEGF, another big player, uh, phospholipase A2, PGE2, I mean, all of these, ENOS, Right, uh, and look at the cellular outcomes: basement membrane thickening, extracellular matrix expansion. There's cardiomyopathy, all of these things, right? And all of that linked to hyperglycemia. But hyperglycemia itself is responsible for upticking DAG, right? So these are all bad things. This is all your diabetic paradigm. Now, again, very briefly, because I went through this in such elegant detail when I went through sphingolipid metabolism. Remember that sphingolipids are different than glycerolipids. You just saw the pathway there. I mean, I didn't show you all the molecular structures because to save time, but let's look here. A lipid that is also very important in the membrane, very important signaling molecule. The, the topic, in fact, of today's lecture are the sphingolipids. Remember, sphingolipids come from palmitoyl-CoA, okay? And palmitoyl-CoA comes from the diet, comes from the a seroplasm and can come directly from what? Fatty acid synthase. Okay. But there's different sources of palmitate. Palmitate remember, is a 16 carbon fatty acid saturates, C16 colon O to be exact. Anyways, uh, the way you make ceramide de novo is you combine palmitate with coi with serine, decarboxylate. Uh, you ultimately put it, uh, you add a fatty acid as an amide linkage. You do a desaturation of that palmitate. I told you it's a trans double bond, very stable in all membranes. Uh huh, that's right. Trans fatty acids are not unusual in membranes at all, and they're not toxic at all. Big, uh, big, um, much ado about nothing. We talk about trans fatty acids. Another story, another time. Anyway, ceramide can also be broken down to sphingosine, and when it is by ceraminidase, okay, you're removing that amide linked fatty acid. Then you make sphingosine, and that could be phosphorylated sphingosine 1-phosphate, and that has basically 180-degree different activities of ceramide. So this is really interesting stuff, right? This is all complex signaling molecules you're making. I'm sorry I had to even go through it, but I did because I wasn't sure that you saw those recently. Let's look at this. The conversion of sphingomyelin to ceramide can play also a membrane structural physical role. Okay, so you have membrane microdomains, as of course I'm sure that you feel comfortable understanding. And when you remove a membrane lipid like sphingomyelin because of the activity of neutral sphingomyelinase, you're going to alter that membrane biology. You're going to alter vesiculation, fusion, fission, vesicular trafficking, the whole bit. In other words, cellular signaling is going to be altered because you're making ceramide. So if you induce ceramide by turning on a neutral sphingomyelinase enzyme, which breaks down membrane-associated sphingomyelin, you would turn on a cascade that doesn't just cause a lot of intracellular metabolic pathways to kick in and even transcriptional regulation in the nucleus. You also alter that really important membrane structure, the plasma membrane and all the other membranes that have any of those sphingolipids. And so that's how a cell responds to stress and how it lives in its normal homeostatic state as well. Membranes are the key. Membrane perturbation is how a cell knows whether or not it's in stress. So for example, the Golgi, ceramide takes part in metabolic flux towards sphingomyelin, DAG, and all the glycosphingolipids. And that drives something called lipid fat ras formation, which carries proteins happily on their way as little cargo in the lipid vesicle to the plasma membrane. Some of them can leave the cell. Some of those proteins, for example, like immunoglobulins, right? Or they play a major role in cells such as, uh, yeah, let me think. How about G protein coupled receptors? Right? So it's all signaling. It's all very, very, very complex, but also understandable and uh, tractable if you keep in mind that lipids are the key to everything in the living systems. That's the only thing you really have to start with. That's like a major chapter verse understanding. After that, you just have to go through the molecularity of it, and that'll take you 20, 30 years. No big deal. Okay. At the cell surface, receptor clustering and lipid rafts also is important, and that is associated with ceramide formation, which, again, I told you is transient. 
You synthesize ceramide, you can also break it down or you can metabolize it. You can also resynthesize sphingomyelin. Yep. So ceramide can affect permeability of all the membranes in the cell, including the mitochondrial outer membrane. And when it does that in particular, it causes the release of cytochrome C. And I know all you apoptosis jockeys out there realize that that's the beginning of the mitochondrially associated apoptotic program cell death. Right? That's that's what's going on. Right? That's how ceramide plays a major role in whole, affecting permeability of the membrane. All right. Once again. I love these pathways. I'm sorry, you know, the structures and the structures are so cool. But again, sphingomyelin broken down to ceramide, which is the neutral sphingomyelinase. Uh, and ceramide gets metabolized sphingosine one phosphate. Here's the de novo synthesis pathway. So you make ceramide two different ways. That's what I want you to know. And you can also resynthesize ceramide via ceramide synthase. It's a salvage pathway. So there's the de novo, there's the salvage, and there's the so called degradation pathway. Ceramide, key player in sphingolipid metabolism. It's a really important signaling molecule. In fact, you also make ceramide 1-phosphate. I mean, it, it gets really beautiful at the molecular level. All right, results of this paper. DAG content in the NWA, right? Now, remember what those were. Those were the athletic people. It's approximately twofold higher than in the obese group and 50% higher in the sedentary group, okay? Corresponding all, apparently, to higher insulin sensitivity. So, wow, it says DAG content was twofold higher in the athletes, not lower. That kind of knocked out one of those early theories. Holy smokes, what does that mean? Could mean a lot of things. Could just mean that you're peeling off that one fatty acid from the triacyclosterol and going into beta oxidation. You're doing all that really important contraction because you're making a lot of ATV from the beta oxidation. And that steady state level of DAG is all you're measuring. It's just up because you're hydrolyzing a lot of TAG to DAG. You're also making a lot of MAG, monoacyclosterol, but the DAG level stays steady state because that's the intermediate. Let's see? All right. Again, just talking about first order, second order uh, thermodynamics, all this sort of stuff plays a role in lipids as it does in everything when you're at the biochemical level. Also, think about there are certain DAG moieties. So they're not all the same. It depends on what the fatty acids are associated. Is it a saturated fatty acid? Is it a monounsaturated fatty acid? Is it a polyunsaturated fatty acid? And of those, is it omega-3, omega-6, or omega-9 even? Right? All that makes a big effect on the DAG signaling activity through the PKC pathway. And also the DAG metabolites. Because once you peel off those fatty acids, they do different things. They can make glands, for example, if they're polyunsaturated fatty acids. So also interesting, ceramide content was higher in insulin-resistant obese muscles. So DAG content was higher, but ceramide content was higher in the obese muscle. So now we're seeing a difference between DAG and ceramide. That doesn't surprise me at all. I think it surprised these authors, though, because I think they thought ceramide looks a little bit like DAG, you know, very uh, greasy compound, right? Two fatty acids and all that, although the ceramide's amide linked. That, and that alters a lot of the physical chemistry of that molecule. And now they're signaling, but that's okay. That's what they thought. But look, you get differences here, right? Ceramide content higher. You remember what ceramide does? Program cell death. Program cell death, good? No, not in muscle cells, maybe in cancer cells. So also the expression of a protein called oxpat or perilipin 5, ADP, uh, excuse me, adipose tag lipase, which I already told you about. That's the lipase that's found in the adipose. And an enzyme called steroid desaturase, which makes oleic acid, acid, were all higher in the athletes. So what are these two here? These are breaking down tag, that IMTG. This is taking uh, stero steric acid, which is synthesized from palmitic acid via elongation reactions in the ER, if you were paying attention before, uh, and you desaturate ster steric acid to oleic acid. Now, oleic acid is really important in certain sphingolipid molecular species. So remember, this isn't just a story about beta oxidation and energy. It's like all these fatty acids play different roles, right? They could be precursors to things like Autocoid hormones. What do I mean by what, what autocoid hormone? For example, prostaglandins, leukotrienes, prostacyclins, and thromboxanes. Right? All of those have a major, very significant role even in muscle tissue. We already know they have a major role in uh, the uh, cardiac muscle, but also in skeletal muscle. All right. That corresponded to a higher mitochondrial content, of course, because you're making more fatty acids. Proportion of type 1 myocytes, that's, that's just, those are the good level myocytes. A lot of 
IMTGs, a lot of DAGs, and good insulin sensitivity. So this is all good stuff. It was all found in those athletes. Remember the athletes. Now, the OxPat Pat one is a, what is it? It's a PPR, that's a proxyproliferator activated receptor induced lipid droplet protein that promotes fatty acid utilization. Okay, so PPAR normally turns this um, expression of this gene on. And when that gene is turned on, what it does is break down that unit membrane around the oil droplet because there are proteins in there called periolipins, and it sort of like removes the protein lipid interface structure of the oil droplet so it could be accessed by the neutral lipase. And then that's fatty acid going to beta oxidation. It's all a nice, cool, linear pathway. And PPAR is involved in the expression of it, which also is very understandable because that's what's normally happening when you're promoting fatty acid utilization, such as active athletes. Okay. Another paper, quick. This is, uh, again, an older paper, but these all are building. This is in BBA. Distinct cellular pools of periolipin point to roles in lipid trafficking, there are, et cetera. The path family lipid storage drop of proteins regulate neutral lipid metabolism. We just mentioned that. Periolipin 5, which has all these different names, is in two distinct or discrete intracellular pools. The lipid storage droplet itself, the one that we think is a good player. And then these poorly characterized cytosolic lipids, right? These non Foculated associated triacylglycerols and diacylglycerols, and maybe phospholipids. So small periolipin 5 encoded structures do not contain the path protein periolipin 2, but do contain 3. This is all like getting into, again, the molecularity here. But the size and density of those particles, as well as susceptibility to degradation by lipases, suggest like the larger LDs, they have a neutral lipid rich core, which is still TAG or maybe DAG. When treated with oleic acid, I remember you're going to make that when you tune up the desaturase, steroid desaturase, and that promotes neutral lipid deposition. That's what happens ultimately when you make oleic acid. Cells ectopically expressed in paralipin 5 experienced a reorganization of the lipid droplet in the cell, resulting in fewer larger droplets at the expense of the smaller ones. Okay? Collectively, what all this says in this paper is the data demonstrate the proportion of cytosolic periolipin fiber sites in high density lipid droplet complexes, and those participate in frank, solid, good, healthy cellular neutral lipid accumulation. So let's discuss this. Total cellular diacylglycerol, markedly higher and higher in, in athletes, corresponding with higher insulin, ins, insulin sensitivity, right? Suggests a more complex role for DAG's insulin action. I already told you, you're going to see that. Data provide additional evidence in humans linking ceramized insulin resistance. We already said that. Study provide novel evidence supporting a role for specific skeletal muscle proteins, those periolipins. And that's something we need to look at. So in other words, once you get down to the molecularity, you can't just talk about how much IMTG is there. You have to talk about all the other players. Okay, so this, these kind of papers are really useful. Exercise training does indeed decrease ceramide and DAG in conjunction with increased oxidative capacity. But again, a steady state isn't necessarily decreased. It just means you're going a lot from TAG to DAG because you have a lot of TAG in storage. You see? Stink roles that chronic exercise obesity may play in the link between potentially harmful lipid species and skeletal muscle insulin resistance. However, we're still not sure about this. Again, ceramide probably is involved in that insulin resistance. But not known whether specific molecular species of any of those, specific molecular species of ceramide, what fatty acid is amide linked. Uh, it could be uh, behenic acid, which is a C22 saturated fatty acid. It could be oleic acid. Totally different structures. And in fact, those are biomarkers from where the ceramide is made. Okay, I'm not going to go into the molecularity of that. Right now, I notice I'm saying molecularity rather than the weeds, because I hate the weeds. And I mentioned that a couple of lectures ago. These aren't weeds. These are molecules. Okay. So anyways, chain length, the degree of saturation of fatty acids found in those, um, those particular neutral lipids is probably playing a major role in all this diversity of what we see in obese versus healthy muscle tissue. And we just aren't there yet in just uh, distinguishing those properties. All right. Study did use mass spec to quantify the content of molecular species, so that was good. Um, endurance training athletes, despite having higher MT IMTGs, those are the intra myocellular triacylglycerols, would have the lowest muscular DAG and ceramide content, the highest insulin sensitivity, and the highest mitochondrial content. And they also seem to have uh, less ceramide. All right. Now, again, this is a whole discussion of DAG. And what do I say here? Uh, 
Primary finding with DAC guide was approximately twofold higher within the highly insulin sensitive skeletal muscle compared with the obese, okay? And that does not support a common contemporary view that DAGs are dangerous, okay? To the contrary, such a DAG might be what you want to see in chronically exercised athletic systems. DAD also was in accord with recent findings that DAGs are not elevated in insulin resistant muscle. And controlling for obesity and physical fitness in higher levels of DAG and lean subject compared with obese volunteers as well as with animal studies indicating that increased DAG content in muscle and insulin resistance are not necessarily related. So you can see it go up and down and you don't see it directly linked, right? Correlated to insulin resistance. And I told you that's probably because of the specific molecular species of the DAG. Still possible there's something going on there, uh, but we're not yet sure. Okay. Now, ceramide. Ceramide, we told you, was twofold higher in the obese. And it supports an idea that we've been seeing a lot of times that ceramide seems to enhance insulin resistance and also somehow associated with lower oxidative capacity, maybe because it just is causing mitochondrial dysfunction because it's breaking down the mitochondrial membrane. Remember? Also in accord with previous report that moderate exercise training decreased intramuscular ceramide uh, in people who were previously sedentary also suggests that maybe this is something to pay attention. Really good biomarker and also a big bio player, ceramide, no surprise. Also check this out, higher sphingosine 1-phosphate in obese insulin resistance. Now this is odd because sphingosine 1-phosphate is thought to work opposite of ceramide. But again, thought to work opposite, that's in the cancer literature, not in the metabolic uh, obesity literature. So you have to be very careful where you're looking. Okay. Summary, high level ex exercise training, unexpected associated with higher DAG, that's relative, right? Um, and uh, therefore the total cellular DAG content can't explain uh, sensitivity to insulin. It suggests a role more specific like the species. Ceramides, on the other hand, look like they are bad players. Okay. So uh, one more paper here, JBC, originally uh, slated back to cancer as an anti-cancer therapy, ferentinide, recently shown to have insulin sensitizing and diabetic effects. Also, here we are crossing over. We have an obesity drug being used in cancer. Clinical trials currently underway investigating the utility of the compound. Front and I recently shown to block the synthesis of ceramide. Look here. Whoa, okay, de novo pathway, right? De novo pathway. So maybe this has something to do with insulin resistance, right? Now, why would this be interesting in cancer? Well, ceramide in cancer is a good thing, right? So if this blocks the synthesis of ceramide, you wouldn't want that happening. Yet this might be used, that drug might be used in some chemotherapeutic phenomena, okay? So to be really careful about whether or not it's going to be good in cancer. It looks like probably not if only source of ceramide is the novo pathway. Now, if you're making ceramide from sphingomyelinase activity or via the sphingosine uh, backup pathway, then maybe blocking that step, that desaturase step to make frank ceramide de novo actually won't have any effect at all. So again, you have to go into the molecularity of these studies. All right. So... What was said, though, is inhibitors of the serine palmitable transferase, uh, two of them called myriocin and cycloserine, and a ceramide synthase, that's in, the inhibitor there is fumonisin B1, have potent insulin sensitizing effects in both in vitro and in vivo. So now we kind of think we know why, okay? Because what we do is we're blocking ceramide. You block ceramide biosynthesis, Okay, by those two pathways, you see those are two reactions, two different pathways. Um, guess what? Um, you're going to decrease that damage to the mitochondria. You're going to increase the amount of mitochondria that are pumping electrons through. You're going to decrease the amount of reactive oxygen. You're going to have a more healthy muscle cell. Yeah. So uh, let's just talk about the desaturase and whether or not that that's a direct uh, uh, target for this. It basically prolonged ferentinamide treatment on diet-induced obese mice, improved fat, diet-induced insulin resistance, and hepatic steatosis. So it looks like blocking that desaturase, blocking that ceramide is a good thing, and that ferentinide, ferentinide is actually a good drug uh, in some obesity systems. The observation identified a new mechanism 
uh, using varentinide to contribute to insulin sensitizing because it blocks ceramide biosynthesis to the level of desaturase. Okay, so it just goes on a bit more about its mode of action. I'm not going to worry about this. This is for those of you in pharmacology and uh, pharmaceutical sciences. You can take a look at this, and there's a paper all about it. All right. Again, this is about insulin action and why we think it works that way. It's going to be functioning through the AKT PKB pathway. I'm not going to talk about it here, but you can slow this talk down. And you can read that. Likewise here. All right. Finally, last paper. The most recent paper from the International Immunopharmacology Journal. It was published in, Fe well, it will be published in February 2018. So this is basically this particular journal uh, publishes online before it publishes on print in print so good for us right all right what's this paper about fatty acids act as endogenous ligands for cell surface receptors of course including toll like receptors not something we haven't talked about here but toll like receptors are involved in innate immune responses that should be enough for you as I just say here, TLRs are expressed in innate immune cells inducing pro-inflammatory cytokines. So they're involved in the immune response making inflammation work, right? LPS, lipopolysaccharide from gram-positive bacteria, is in fact the um, paradigmatic patho pathogenomic uh, ligand for the TOLAC receptor 4. So LPS turns on that receptor and you get inflammation. Okay. So LPS, right, the breakdown of gram-positive bacteria in the blood turns on the immune response through TLR4, that's what I just said. It also, also though, alters tag accumulation, ceramide biosynthesis, uh-oh, lipolysis of the tag, and fatty acid oxidation, and well as inducing inflammation. So there's all kinds of things here that LPS does, of course, right, because it's a, you know, bacterial lipid. So it's going to have one effect. Heck no. All right, so fatty acid oxidation regulates macrophage polarization. This is going to get cool here. We're going to talk about macrophages. One of my favorite topics is the immune system. Fatty acid oxidation regulates macrophage polarization. It affects the production of inflammatory cytokines. So polarization means the macrophages can exist in two different forms. So we'll, we'll talk about it. Fatty acid transport protein, another player here for this talk, for this, for this paper, uh, called FATP. I talked about it for before, but I'm not going to go through all the details of it, but in previous lectures, is found in the plasma membrane of intracellular organelles, has fatty acylcoagulase activity, is essential for fatty acid uptake. So when you want to take a fatty acid from the cytoplasm into the mitochondrion, you have the carnitine palmitoyl transferase. If you want to take it into the ER, the Golgi, or the peroxisome, or back to the plasma membrane, you need these FATPs. And they have this uh, this is this ligase activity. So once you get a fatty acid in, it ligates to CoA, so it's no longer toxic, and now it's a metabolic play. And of course, um, these FATPs are expressed in macrophages. So this paper is going to uh, look at the role of these FA FATPs in the inflammatory response mediated by fatty acids using a particular macrophage called the bone marrow derived macrophage, or BMDM. Um, they're going to look at also within the mouse macrophage cell line, the raw 264.7 cells, and they're going to be looking at LPS-induced acute lung injury, or ALI, in the mouse model. So they're using cells, they're, uh, the macrophages, okay, they're using, uh, using mouse macrophage cell lines, and they're looking directly at a mouse model. The results, uh, animal model, the results suggest that this FATP1, which is only one isoform, I think there's six of them total, regulates the production of inflammatory cytokines through ceramide, there you go, and the C JUN N terminal kind of the junk or the J and K signaling pathway. Okay. Now, these BMDM are, were generated with um, and stimulated with LPS and interferon gamma for M1 polarization or interleukin-4 for M2 polarization. So I told you there were two forms of these uh, macrophages. You need LPS or uh, interferon uh, gamma for M1 polarization, or you need IL-4 pro-inflammatory cytokine for M2 polarization. M1 fat macrophages, keep it in mind, produce inflammatory cytokines. M2 manufa uh, manufacture um, have a low production, excuse me, of inflammatory cytokines and a high production of anti-inflammatory cytokines. 
of different interleukin family, right? Whoa, okay, so see the polarity. M1, let's make things inflamed and signal and turn on the entire immune system and get the acquired immune system over here to look at this lesion. M2 macrophages, slow it down, buddy. We don't want a lot of those pro-inflammatory cytokines. In fact, we want to make some anti-inflammatory cytokines to control the inflammatory response, the inflammasome system. So what else? Uh, nitric oxide synthase 2 is an M1 macrophage marker. So when you see NOS2, that means you're in the pro-inflammatory state. And it was induced in M1 macrophages. And arginase 1, an M2 macrophage marker, was induced in M2 macrophages. So you make nitric oxide, okay, but you make it from two different systems. Now, I'm not going to be able to go through this whole system with you, but let me put my glasses on and just take a look why I even put it here. And finally, I need glasses. There's the M1 pathway, typical. Okay, check this out. When you, now you're talking about how macrophages talk to the acquired immune system, specifically T cells. M1 talks to Th1. That's the inflammation system. Um, M2, you talk more to the Th2 pathway, okay, which is immunoregulation. So M1, macrophage 1, talk to Th1, pro-inflammatory. M2, talk to Th2 pathway, which tends to control or immunoregulate, okay, immunoregulate. So that's because how M1 and M2 are different in what they bind. We already told you that M1 binds interferon gamma, which turns on uh, the pro-inflammatory response through the JEK-STAT pathway. You don't need to know that. Viruses can do that. The LPS is doing that. Um, uh, Green uh, macrophage uh, colony stimulating factor also does that. Um, M2, remember where it works through IL-4. Part of it is a STAT pathway, but it's a unique one. It's a STAT-6 pathway. IgG can turn on this pathway, IL-10, glucocorticoids, which you know are immunosuppressive. Uh, and here is this uh, macrophage colony stimulating uh, factor involved in this one here. And look at that. It's making uh, stringosine mm -hmm. uh, one phosphate. How interesting is that, right? Okay. So what are the results of this paper? Okay. Just jump right into it now. That's right. Take off these terrible glasses. The FATP1 and the FATP4, remember these are these transport proteins, are markedly increased in M1 macrophages, whereas the six isoform is markedly increased in the M2. Okay, cool. Remember what these are. These are involved in the regulation of fatty acid uptake in macrophages. Now, the expression of 2, 3, and 5 in M1 and M2 macrophages was similar. Oh, thank God, we don't have all kinds of dissimilarity, okay? Similar, and it was, that was similar to just naive macrophages, the ones that are not induced. So that's good. We can kind of not talk about those. So one, FATP1, was most highly expressed among the FATP isoforms, however, uh, in all of the BMDM that we looked at, or they looked at, which suggests that the FATP1 is the main player for fatty acid uptake in macrophages. Even so you see a differential, it's still there. It's still probably its main function is taking up fatty acids, okay? Now, what happens downstream is going to be uh, where all the molecularity is. So, LPS enhanced fatty acid uptake in a time-dependent manner. Okay, so it's going to enhance fatty acid uptake through that fat one, okay? But IL-4 did not cause more fatty acid uptake providing evidence that the it's at the level of the FATP, which decides whether or not you get a specific polarity of the macrophage or the phenotypic dependent macrophage lineage. So FATP1 may contribute to LPS increased fatty acid uptake. FATP1 enhances the inflammatory cytokine production. LPS induces cytokine production through, these are the intracellular players, transcription factor under kappa B, uh, the uh, junk pathway, P38, MAP kinase, and ERK pathway. All of those are intact in macrophage. These are all big immune cell, turn on the immune cell, phosphorylation dependent cascades, signal transduction cascades. Transcription level all the way at the phosphorylation level. So overexpression of the FATP upregulates the level of phosphorylation of junk, but not P38, MAP kinase. So see, already... A little bit downstream, you're seeing what's turned on, what's not. These pathways diverge. They diverge, and they diverge at the level of what the ligand signaling is. Ceramide, however, mediates production of inflammatory cytokines like IL-6 via junk phosphorylation. So FATP1, phosphorylation of junk, junk turning on IL-6. 
via ceramide, you see? So overexpression of FATP1 increases the levels of ceramide in the presence of the polysaccharide, the bacterial outer cell wall lipid antigen. Uh, ceramide activates NF-kappa B in macrophages. So the ceramide junk NF-kappa B pathway contributes to, you see this is a linear pathway, the FATP1 dependent cytokine production. So ceramide is playing a role here. Now this is not the same role it was playing when we're talking about apoptosis. This is just turning on cytokine production. See? And it's, this is how it's being used through this whole cascade system. So let's make a general discussion already. The overexpression and silencing, okay, all or nothing, right, square of opposition, of FATP1 enhanced overexpression or suppressed silencing of inflammatory cytokines. You get more FATP1, you get more inflammatory cytokines, you get less, you get less of the inflammatory cytokines. Okay. Should be clear as the night with full moon by now. Now, FATP1 regulates the production of inflammatory cytokines through ceramide. I told you that. The data shows, I'm not showing all the data. I'm just discussing it. I told you to save time. And it's going through the uh, uh, John kinase pathway. M1 macrophages rely on glycolysis. Interesting. While M2 macrophages require the induction of fatty acid oxidation. So there's two different carbon sources here, right? So remember, we can talk all we want to about lipid metabolism in terms of the level of ceramide, disoglycerol, triacylglycerol. But remember that regardless of that, these cells are going to use different carbon sources. And so just keep in mind that the anaerobic pathway to make NADH for the, uh, and ultimately though, of course, pyruvate dehydrogenase making acetyl-CoA and then running the TCA cycle, which will make a lot more NADH than FADH2, um, are glycolytically driven in the M1s, whereas it's all beta oxidation in the M2s. Okay. That's important. It's a fuel question. All right, LPS first stimulated the synthesis of ceramide and TAG. Okay. Subsequently, fatty acids are consumed in the cells. What follows is macrophage uptake of fatty acid through the FATP1 to recover, presumably, the consumed fatty acid. So this cell becomes deficient in fatty acid. The signaling goes on. Fatty acid is taken up via the FATP1. Overexpression of the FATP1 enhances cytokine production, whereas overexpression of the isoform 4 or 6 has no effect on that. Okay, So again, these are pleiotropic effects of a protein that's been described just as a transfer protein. It's what these are. But once you get beyond that transfer complex and even consequential and commiserate with that transport process, sometimes temporally uh, linear, sometimes a temporarily nonlinear, um, you get different effects, whether or not, for example, you get uh, production of uh, cytokines, proflamatory cytokines. Okay, this functional difference is due to the type of transport of fatty acid. Ultimately, what kind of fatty acids are coming in from these different transporters? Oh, wow. FATP1 brings in palmitate and oleate and a little bit of C24 colon O. That's a fully, fully un, uh, saturated C24 fatty acid. Substrates, however, for four are just that fatty acid, and for six is just oleic acid, arachidonic acid, okay, and C20, again, 24 colon O, the saturated fatty acid. Very interesting. So C16O is transported, it looks like, famously, exclusively by FATP1. And that can play a critical role in the production of inflammatory cytokines since it activates, that particular fatty acid activates the TLRs, toll-like receptors, it turns up, it tunes up the inflammasome activity and therefore produces more inflammatory cytokines like TNF-alpha, IL-6, and IL-1-beta, the real player there. Right. So maybe FATP1 contributes to these functions through c 16 uptake. Also remember, ceramide synthesis, remember, needs palmitic acid in the form of palmitable CoA dependent upon palmitable CoA for de novo synthesis. And that may artificially increase ceramide levels and then turn on this whole cascade. So maybe palmitic acid entering FATP1 is used or targeted to make ceramide, and that ceramide then turns on the pro-inflammatory cascade system. Ceramide, now one last thing, ceramide also mediates 
um, acute respiratory distress syndrome. This is a third disease, maybe a fourth disease I'm talking about already this afternoon. We're almost there, We're almost done. Serum is elevated in the bronchoalveolar lavage fluid or the BALF of patients with that disease. Very bad disease kills you if it's not treated. And serum is increased in blood from sepsis patients, which is another problem that you often see, for example, in the emergency room. So the level of serum correlates with mortality, right? So a lot of people can die from, AR, uh, from uh, complications of ARDS, and of course, a lot of people die from sepsis. And it looks like serum is elevated. We already know what serum is doing in pro-inflammatory responses, and it's causing apoptosis. So see, since palmitic acid drives the inflammatory response in the lung via ceramide, production may be targeting of FATP1 could diminish the whole system, could limit macrophage activity, at least the M1 activity in the lung, and it may help you actually cure or be part of the medicines to go after ARDC, uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is, again, a very common, very deadly disease, lung disease, basically. Also may, may be potentially useful in sepsis, although, you know, antibiotics are useful in sepsis. All right, we are finally done. Thank you very much for your exquisite uh, patience while I went through this. I hope that you learned something about ceramide. Uh, in biology, particularly pathobiology. We went through various different disease states, obesity. Um, we, we talked about intramyocellular lipid metabolism. We talked about various forms of cancers. We talked about how ceramide plays uh, generally a very complex role, but specifically sometimes a very positive role in cancer and a negative role in metabolic disease. That's a simply put way of describing what we just went through. And then other lipids play central and coherent roles, and you need to keep them all in mind. You need to look at different cell types, even different cell lineages like the level of macrophages and T cells in terms of what uh, you're trying to affect in, say, a given uh, therapy. Uh, okay, so ending now. Um, I'm Dan Guerra. Again, I'm the Chief Science Officer of Vera Med. That's my company there. There's my Facebook page. Uh, there's the um, email address for the company. You contact me through there. There's a website for us. Uh, and again, there's my personal email. You can talk to me about any of these specific video lectures I've given, and you can you can start the process of talking to me uh, if you want to become a client for Vera Med. So um, hopefully 2018 will be a fantastic year for everybody, not just people who listen to this, but everybody around and across the wonderful earth. So take care and goodbye for now.